Good morning, YouTube. Today, we're going to compare the Ferrari 458 to the Ferrari F8. So, are you recording all of the nefarious activities? If you're new to the channel, my name is Dan, and we are at Fred's house here in California, and these are both of his Ferraris. This is his Ferrari 458 Spider and his brand new Ferrari F8 Spider. We're gonna do a little bit of comparison today. I did this previously with the F430 and the 458 and even the 458 and the 488. Well, today we're gonna to compare the 458 to the latest and greatest, the F8. And is this F8 really worthy of carrying on that same tradition? You'll see, you'll see. It's a pretty amazing car. So let's talk all about these two. But before we do real quick, if you can support the channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing, we do appreciate that greatly. Also, please go visit normalguysupercar.com and there you can buy parts and services for your car. Use the code NGS10, it'll hook you up with 10% off almost everything we sell. All right, guys, let's talk all about these two beautiful and stunning cars. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! So one thing that is obvious about these two cars is, of course, the styling differences. You know, they're pretty much the same platform. They have basically the same body position and the stance is basically the same. The dimensions are almost the same, although slightly different. There are obviously some major styling cues. You've got these front canards on the 458. And instead, you have this big air intake or air scoop that actually comes through the hood on the Ferrari F8. So that is obviously one of the biggest differences. And of course, you had the eyelash kind of style headlights. I don't know exactly what you want to call them, but they kind of gave it this like kind of menacing look versus these. They carry on that same kind of swoop, but the headlight itself is only right here. And you can see up here, it's actually an air intake. So we do have air intakes right there. And of course, a vent right there on the 458. So they did change that stuff around a little bit. Some substantial and more modern styling cues in the Ferrari F8. You can actually see that, believe it or not, the side view mirrors are, well, they're identical. They're the same side view mirrors. There's literally nothing different about them. Of course, the windshield looks pretty much to be identical as well. And even the side profile overall, other than the giant scoops for the intakes on the Ferrari F8, well, they're not that much different, but they do have some kind of different body ground effects. So you can see down there at the bottom, we have kind of these, these pieces that stick out, give it a little bit more arrow that kind of obviously guide the air across the side of the car. Whereas in the 458, this kind of just has a big piece right there. It's not as pronounced of a protrusion right there. And one thing to note was this was the last Ferrari to actually be designed by Pininfrina. So this, of course, was designed by Ferrari in-house, so it is not a Pininfarina car anymore. Funny enough, the traditional little yellow side mark there that you can see on the Ferrari 458, well, they finally have a little tiny LED, give it a modern light. That was about time that they did that. And of course, we do have the same handles as the 488 in the F8, which are obviously a lot different than the 458 with those little kind of scoop style handles. Basically from like here, on the upper third of the car, it is almost identical. You really couldn't tell a difference. I mean, this panel is identical. All of this is identical. Even the operation of the convertible top is pretty much identical. Where we really start to see some standout differences is in the rear of the car. The Ferrari 458 went to the single large taillights, which I actually have to admit, I'm not as big a fan of that. I prefer the old style dual head, their dual taillights that they had on all the Ferraris previous to the 458. So they did this in the 458, and the 488, they both had the single large tail lights. We have the two side vents and we have a large diffuser, but this is actually just a static diffuser. There's no active arrow, no nothing like that. And of course the homage to the F40, the triple tail pipes. Here you can see massive differences in the rear end of the car with the dual tail lights on each side. You still have some ventilation on each of the sides. You have two large single tailpipes and a massive, massive diffuser that actually has active arrow. And you even have this little tiny uh, arrow piece right here where air goes through and actually flows through right there. That is pretty cool. And one thing I just noticed kind of looking at the two is the engine cover is much smaller on the F8. So it is a little bit narrower and it's not quite as long. And from there to the end of the car is much more substantial than it is on the 458. You can see the engine bonnet comes way out to the end of the car in this, and it's much, much larger, much wider. So you have much more room to get access to the engine. Okay, speaking of the engine, here's where we have the most substantial difference between the two. 
Of course, the 458 is a 4.5 liter naturally aspirated flat plane crank, 9,000 RPM engine pumping out 560 horsepower with 390 or so foot pounds of torque. And it is just the most glorious sounding Ferrari engine that you can imagine. I absolutely love this engine. It is bulletproof, no timing belts to deal with, no major services like that. It is reliable and stout and of course just fun with linear progression of power. Very easy to control, especially when you're playing. Unfortunately, with the Spider, you can't see it. It's pretty much tucked under there, but it's a very beautiful engine with these big red intakes and of course the red valve covers. There are some very prominent vents to allow the heat to escape from the engine. And of course you still have some engine bay covers and right there are the catalytic converters. So very well exposed. You could get easy access to a lot of the components of the engine to work on. And here you can see we have a much smaller lid. It still has vents on the top, but again, can't really see the engine a whole lot. It is tucked way in there. It is actually an attractive engine. It still has red intake covers and red valve covers. Uh, down there somewhere right there is the catalytic converters. And well, you know, you have the turbos tucked in way up in the fenders. And of course there are some intercoolers and that's why you have those big scoops is to help those intercoolers stay cool. Uh, it's still pretty clean. I mean, there's a bit more stuff to deal with in here. It's a little bit more crowded. And of course, this is only a 3.9 liter engine and it only revs to 8,500, but it still is really, really powerful, putting out 710 horsepower, 560 or so foot-pounds of torque. This is where we run into the big debate. Does the F8 have that same soul because of the turbos or did we lose the soul and lose that naturally aspirated good sound? So sitting in the Ferrari 458, we have the analog tachometer with the digital gauges. So here's one of the downsides of the 458 is, well, these controls right here for the infotainment are not the most intuitive. You have dual buttons. So these buttons, they have the little text. So you push it menu, you push and hold for setup, main, you push and hold for off, you push and hold for view. So that actually makes it kind of wonky. So you can see I have to push and hold stuff and do a bunch of weird things to get things to cooperate correctly. It's very confusing. And while you're driving, it makes it really annoying. On the left-hand side, we do have some gauges to tell you what's going on. The way to control those are right here. You have this circular button with arrows. So it's pretty intuitive, not too bad, reasonably okay to deal with. Uh, pretty simple with only three main buttons. And then of course an okay button. Uh, basically we have this setup status trip and VDA. That's all you get four different main functions of that display. This Ferrari also had the turn signals mounted on the steering wheel as the first one to do that. I personally love that they did that. That was a huge improvement over the stocks on the side. Once you get used to this, you'll think this is the way it should be. The only complaint is the way that these buttons operate. You basically do a push and hold to get it to do three blinks and you tap it once and it'll keep blinking until you turn or you cancel it. You have your windshield wiper controls, the Manatino switch to set your different driving modes. And over here you have bumpy road and your high beams. The 458 had a lot of flack about the AC controls. I'll admit they're kind of a little bit wonky. There's a lot of arrows and stuff going on. There's all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, once you get used to it, it's actually very simple. It's pretty easy. You basically have temperature, where the air is going, how fast it's going and then you know a couple other buttons that's really about it so it's not a big deal but it just it kind of looks intimidating but it's really not a big deal to operate down in the center console you have your launch control you have the reverse button and your auto button as well as your window switches and then the uh, buttons to operate the roof and the rear window and down here is kind of weird this is your way to open up your glove box so you know why the buttons down here instead of having a button over here or a latch i don't know if that was kind of not super intuitive. But one of the big things about this 458 that's gonna stand out compared to the F8 is of course, the sound of that naturally aspirated engine. Oh yeah, that's what we want. We love that sound. And of course you can see the 9,000 RPM red line, which is absolutely astounding in a four and a half liter V8 engine. Yeah, that sound right there is, uh, Lovely, we love that. Well, first off, when you get in the F8, you're gonna notice substantially different compared to the 488. So I feel like the 458 and the 488 are effectively the same, and then the F8 really took a step forward and improved it a lot. We have much more intuitive controls, none of that dual purpose button stuff over here. You have a little wheel to select your stuff, you have a volume control, and then you have, you know, pretty obvious home settings, back, and favorites. So that's pretty easy to deal with. And actually, the display itself 
seems to be of higher resolution and really be a little bit easier to deal with. So, you know, if I click on some of these buttons, you can see the way that it's set up, instead of having these little arrows directing you to do things, you just spin the dial and select what you're trying to do. So, you know, if we want to do media, you just select that right there. And that right there alone is such an improvement. It makes it so much more easy to deal with this car. On the left-hand side, we have the same kind of concept where you have your gauges and other things right there. So you can see, we can click on this and we have our speedometer. We have the oil pressure, or the oil temperature and water temperature, oil pressure, battery, and tires. So a little bit easier to deal with where you got this uh, little spinning wheel uh, kind of design. I think people have gotten used to this as kind of the standard in the automotive world of how to control your car. A few other options, you know, you've got trip stuff, you've got VDA, which both cars have, and you of course have information about the turbo and of course our settings. But as you can see, we have the 8,000 RPM tachometer. I think I said 8,500 earlier. I guess I've messed up. It's 8,000 RPMs, which is still for a turbocharged engine, absolutely massive. The steering wheel is improved a little bit. It has a different design than the more modern design with a smaller airbag. But the big thing to me was the turn signals are the way that they should be now. So to do these, you just do a click and this is three blinks. If you do two clicks deep, now it's blinking until it cancels or until you turn. That is much more intuitive, much easier to deal with. We still have the uh, windshield wiper controls on the right hand side, but instead of being one button, you now have this dial that lets you know where it's at. I have to say, the way that you click the other one it is a little bit confusing because you basically just keep clicking the same button over and over so it's basically like almost like a motorcycle transmission where you shift it up 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 that kind of thing uh, we have our bumpy road mode our high beams and we even have some controls to manage your telephone the controls to manage the infotainment on the steering wheel themselves did change from buttons and little uh, paddles so now we have these little spinning wheels i actually think it's a little bit more intuitive to deal with again when you're driving it's a little bit easier to work with and it allows you to actually manage the different settings on the panel so i actually appreciate this a lot more but the big thing here is we now have the buttons that used to be in the center console up here we have our camera button parking sensors this used to be up on the ceiling in the 458 and our axle lifter so this is a little bit easier to deal with when you're trying to raise your axle instead of trying to find the button down here. We have a bridge for the controls for your power start, auto, and reverse. And you have your AC controls, which look much less intimidating, way easier to deal with. And you have a digital display to actually show you what's going on. So this is a little bit more modern. I think this is a much appreciated improvement in the Ferrari F8. The center console itself isn't dramatically different. It looks fairly similar, but Otherwise, the buttons are just slightly different. They have a little bit of a tactile feel difference. And we even have some switches that are mounted now on the door, for example, the windows control, and the buttons to release the trunk and the fuel door are on the door itself instead of located in the floor, which makes it a little bit easier to get to them. So let's fire this one up and you can hear the difference. So immediately the, the sound is not quite as dramatic or loud. The valves close and well, and the sound kind of disappears. You can hear with, with the car at idle with the valves closed, it's uh, not real impressive. So right there, we're kind of demonstrating the fundamental flaw in the turbo car is that, well, it just doesn't have that same Ferrari sound that we've grown to love. So let's take them out on the road and you can hear the differences and see whether or not it makes enough of a difference that, well, does the performance of the F8 offset the lack of soul from the lack of sound? Well, let's find out. So one thing to point out is this is a completely stock Ferrari 458. I believe the only thing that's been done to it is we pulled the valves so that the exhaust valves are always open. But otherwise, this is what you get from the factory. It is a very clean, low mileage car. So, I mean, it's a pretty good representation of what this car was when it first came out. So one thing that's a big complaint to me is that although it has Bluetooth, the Bluetooth only works for the phone. It does not actually work for the, for the music. So if you want to have music playing through the system off your phone, you have to buy a iPod adapter and this little Bluetooth Bovi thing and it just 
it's always kind of wonky. It just never feels right. Driving around already. That sound, oh yeah. Okay, here we go. So right now we're in sport. We're gonna switch it to race. Should tighten up the steering a little bit, tighten up the suspension a little bit. You can hear that wonderful naturally aspirated V8 sound. Very quick shifts, you know, the, the dual clutch transmissions really have good shifts. So one thing that I love about the 458 is that the power curve is very linear. It comes on progressively. It doesn't come on like a sledgehammer. It's really easy to control. And when you're near the limits, it's exceptional. You can really balance the car with the throttle pedal. You can you know, steer it almost with just using the throttle when you come around corners. You put it near the edge and you just roll the throttle. Yeah, nice Porsche. Super precise handling, really nimble, and it's very comfortable. You know, the ride in this is very good quality. A little bit bouncy when you're in race mode and sport mode, it's excellent. Just the right amount of power, you know, it's, a, it's not so crazy that when you slam the pedal down, you feel like you're gonna die. Like, you feel like you're in control, and it, you know, the car will give you a little bit of, of leeway with the computer set to race mode. It will get a little squirrely here and there, but you never feel like, oh my God, this is trying to kill me. Which you'll see in the F8, yeah, it'll, it'll try and kill you. It's, it's amazing, the difference. You can't find a flaw in the handling. It is near perfection with balance and precision and tightness, it just, it's outstanding. It's one of my favorite cars ever to drive at speed. It is just outstanding. You really have to love this car and the way it handles. We're gonna go out and do some launch control. All right, here we go. Try and get this little sip, and ready? So one complaint I have is the launch control in this car is it leaves a little bit something desired. It kind of falls flat on its face. When you let go of that brake pedal and you really give it hell, it launches good, but it, it just kind of falls flat and then goes. So I think part of that is it spins the tires, the traction control kicks in, and then it just kind of cuts the engine power. So it's really hard to balance that. I mean, what can you do? But it is, that was, that's fun, and this is fast. Let me tell you, this is a fast, fast car. Wonderful to have 9,000 RPMs to work with. You just can keep this up at such a high RPM. Hear that howl, that glorious flat plane sound. Oh, it's hard to believe that the 458 is a 12-year-old design. It just does not feel like it. It feels every bit like a brand new car. I mean, I guess there's a little bit lacking in some of the infotainment designs and ergonomics that they've gotten better over the years. And there's a reason why everyone wants this car. There's a reason why the values of the 458 have skyrocketed in the last year. This car is highly, highly desirable. It's near perfection. To me, this might be simply the best that Ferrari has ever done. Maybe the F40 is better, but this is it. This is peak Ferrari. All the complaints about the infotainment, all the complaints about maybe some of the ergonomics, you forget about them really quickly. As soon as you start driving this car hard, it doesn't matter. You're not worried about the buttons. 
You're not worried about any of that stuff. You just want to go. So right away you can feel that there is some differences. Number one, the transmission actually shifts better, which is pretty impressive considering how good the transmission is in the 458, but it's a little bit quicker, a little bit snappier. And when you're going slow, it's a little bit smoother, but under harder speeds, it really, it, it'll, it'll give you a good thump every time it shifts. And of course, you immediately notice you don't have that same sound. You do have a bit of that turbo whine, even just kind of cruising, especially with the top down, but it's just, it's just kind of lacking that something that you get out of that 458. And again, already, I love the buttons on the steering wheel better. They are definitely a better design. Oh yeah, we got to turn off the stupid auto start stop so it doesn't shut the engine off when we come to a stop. The handling is just minute improvements, but it's definitely just the slightest bit more accurate and precise. The braking just feels a little bit better. Very, very small, almost imperceptible differences, but going back to back of them, you can actually feel it. I mean, you would never notice going from one of these cars to the other in a broad distance. So we're gonna give a little bit of space. Okay, so come out and give a little bit of fun. Jeez. So that's the difference is then that turbo starts going, the torque takes over, and it's, it's almost too much. It's, it's like too much for a street car. Without the computers, you'd be all over the road. I mean, I could control that 458 100% throttle much easier than this. I didn't even get to full throttle. I was at probably 75% throttle right there, spun the tires, coming into third gear. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of responsibility. You gotta be careful with this car. It will bite you if you're not being gentle with it. Plane becomes a little bit more nerve wracking. You gotta be on your A game. You gotta be paying 100% attention. Everything else feels about the same. Of course, we're just not getting that sound. So let's keep it in a higher gear now. Start to go into some corners. There we go. Now we get the car to come alive a little bit. Start to get a little bit more of that feeling. You know, it's not a bad sound. I just wish it had more of it. It's just kind of muted. Oh, the handling is just so, so good. It's almost disappointing because it's so powerful and so fast that you're basically like zero to arrest me fast too quick. You know, it almost makes it so you can't enjoy it for a long period of time. I mean, I'm already caught up the traffic even though we gave him a ton of time at the stop sign back there. It just goes so fast. Here's the ultimate question. Does having that lack of sound mean that you're not going to want this car as much as you're going to want the 458? I mean, that's a personal choice. I think that some of you need to figure out. I don't think I would be disappointed in any way owning this car. I just feel like if I have it, I'm going to have to change the exhaust and do something to really make it sing, get that proper Ferrari sound out of it. Of course, without as many RPMs to play with, Gotta watch the tachometer a little bit more. And the thing is, this thing revs so fast that the LED lights on the steering wheel are basically required. I was driving it last night, we were playing, and man, I couldn't even tell that we were already near the red line. Uh, earlier today I drove it, smacked the rev limiter because it just revs so fast, especially in first and second gears. It's like ridiculous how fast it goes. You gotta be ready to pull that paddle over and over. So you're going through first through fourth gear and literally, three seconds, because then you're already going way above the speed limit. Again, it just it just commands a bit more of you to drive this car well. And I think maybe that's some of it is, that's a little bit more relaxing to drive. You don't have to be quite as precise. You can drive it a little bit harder, a little bit easier. It's a little bit more linear. So it has that forgiving balance to it that allows you to make a little bit of a mistake and still come out ahead. This car, you start making mistakes and you're off of the trees. All right, second gear rolling race. All right, ready? Ready? Three, two, one, go. Yeah, it takes a second for the boost to kick in, but when it does, game over.
Three, two, one, go. Not even fair. Okay, YouTube, so here's the thing. I don't know that it's valid to say that the Ferrari lost its soul when it went to turbos. I would say it definitely did lose some of its sound, but the performance increase is just tremendous. We were joking on the way home, we were talking and we said, you know, if you pulled into a Ferrari lot and you said, oh, I really want the 458 and you go test drive it and you love the sound, you love the feeling, but they happen to have an F8 there and you went out and test drove that next, you'd have a hard time making the decision. I think ultimately the biggest thing's gonna be Right now, this is about $200,000 more than that car. Although those have gone up so much in value that actually it's shrunk down to now closer to like 150. So is this worth $150,000 more? I mean, from the performance standpoint, absolutely. From the emotional standpoint, I'm even gonna say yes, it really is because we were laughing and giggling and smiling and having a grand old time. It is different, it is a different feeling and it, it really commands your attention. You can't be asleep at the wheel to drive this thing fast. It is too quick, it revs too fast, and just takes everything you got to make sure that this thing is going straight. So with that being said, I think that is a little bit more relaxed and it's a little bit more friendly to the general audience. And you can drive it harder with ease. I think it's easier to drive that car faster than it is to drive the F8. I think it takes a lot more conies and a little bit more skill. So ultimately, Neither of these cars are gonna disappoint you. They're both incredible, and I don't think you could go wrong either way. So with that being said, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell, and of course, visit normalguysupercar.com for all your supercar parts and services. But we'll be doing more car stuff really soon, so you guys are gonna to wanna to stay tuned. It's gonna be sweet. He's a normal, normal, normal super guy. He's really cool, and he does a lot of really cool, cool, cool things. Normal, normal, normal guy, super guy. He's really cool, and you're gonna have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. Oh my da -da. god. <laughs> that shall never see the light of day. <laughs> oh, it's gotta be a gag